Good morning to you. Thank you very much for keeping it Y254. This is Y in the morning. My name is Ram Aguko and you're just in time for the next conversation of the day. And today is all about cancer awareness, cancer screening, cancer prevention. Today on Health Tuesday, let's talk about cancer. And uh, currently, uh, it was at number two the last I checked, but uh, I'm told it is at, it, it was at number three. I'm told it's number two in terms of the leading causes of death in the country. We shall understand understand more about that in a bit but to help us understand more about this cancer screening and cancer awareness i'm joined by dr Asf asaf kinyanjui who is a palliative care provider and also the chief executive officer that's the ceo of the nairobi hospice Karibu sana. Thank you. Hope you're well, Dr. I'm very well. And uh, remember, you can be part of this conversation from wherever you're watching us from. The hashtag is Why in the Morning at Ram Aguko and at Y254 channels where you can find us. Head over to Facebook, Twitter, and give in your feedback. Remember, we are live on our website at www.kbc.co.ke forward slash Y254. Participate with us. We shall be able to sample your feedback as you continue with this morning conversation. Um, Dr. Tari, you, before we went on air, you were saying um, we are moving from number three to number two in terms of cancer being the leading cause of death. Um, you know, why so? We've been having this conversation on cancer and um, based on what has been taking center stage, um, especially in the media of, of late, is about cancer awareness. Yes. And, uh, you know, um, I'm now wondering what is making cancer to be so rampant that it is increasing uh, the number of deaths in the country? Okay. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we have different uh, theories why we have a high number. Mm -hmm. But for sure, some of the things which are contributing is that there is a significant change in our lifestyle, uh -huh. uh, putting us more at risk of cancer. Number two is also that uh, the government has really invested in screening mm -hmm. and uh, awareness. And, mm -hmm. and even, and I want to thank the media because it's also been very active in terms of creating awareness. Yeah. So it means more people are now being going to health facilities mm -hmm. and be mm -hmm. diagnosed with uh, cancer. Like in before where people used to die and uh, sometimes they die from cancer and no one knew that they had that disease. Uh -huh. So it's, it's, it's about the increased awareness and also because of the changes in lifestyle, putting more citizens at risk of getting cancer. Uh -huh. yes. So um, th through that we now see the increased numbers because yes. people are now aware about it. People know what's going on. Yes. Um, if you talk about cancer screening, what exactly are we looking into here? Uh, so screening is a modality of trying to look at people in the general population, whether they are, have the disease or not. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you, some of the common cancers, we have the cancers of the breast, which mm -hmm. affect both men and women. We have the cancer of the cervix that affects uh, women. And these cancers are screenable. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that uh, people will walk into a health facility yeah. and they get checked whether they have these cancers or not. Mm -hmm. And therefore, from that day, then they're able to, if they have no disease, then they're able to be guided on how to continue being disease-free. Yeah. Uh, if they have the disease, then they're guided in terms of how they will get the cure and how they will be able to walk that journey. You so, know, yes. yeah, yeah, you, you know, um, as, as, as you talk about cancer screening, um, I know for many young people out there who are watching, they, we, we like Googling a lot. Yes. <laughs> you know, and uh, we like um, checking ourselves to see if we have cancer. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Google, there is a lot yes. you will find. Yes. You know, um, would you recommend that, you know, checking yourself, you know, because uh, there are some who are afraid of, you know, going to the hospital, being told that, hey, we are screening you. You know, they see it as a big deal. They check themselves. You mentioned breast cancer. Yes. You know, if you if you read online, they will tell you, I don't know how you, you, you know, to check yourself. Mm. What's your thought on that? Uh, it's good for one to be aware of their body mm. yeah, because uh, I mean, most of the instances, patients will tell you, maybe I was taking a shower and felt a lump, or, yeah, was, yeah. or maybe I, I realized uh, I had some discharge, or I have lost some weight. So it's good for one to be quite uh, cautious about their health and how their body is. Yeah. But I would urge people to not rely on just on their own findings, but mm. to seek health and from practitioners. Because for example, the breast cancer, we initially mm. we used to advocate for 
self-breast examination. Mm -hmm. But we realize that uh, a good number of people still don't have the right technique and mm -hmm. therefore they still end up missing and having a false source of sense of hope that they are okay. Yeah, yeah. Until when they get to a health facility and then they are examined by a healthcare provider, they realize they already have the disease and sometimes the disease has already advanced. Mm -hmm, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's good to, for one to be aware, but it's very important for people to follow the regular screening yeah. uh, guidelines that have been put in place. Instead of just going to Google and then you Google things and then you begin to panic. Yes. And then you go to the doctor with misinformation. Yes. When the doctor, the doctor tells you something, you're like, but Dr. this is what I learned. Yeah. Very true. Because that, that's what you go through uh, in hospitals. Yes. The, the, the perceptions, the misconceptions about cancer. Mm. Um, before we touch on, uh, on, on other things, I want you to, I want us to take just a step back and look at some of the preventive measures that uh, the Kenyan youth can be able to uh, implement on the ground yes. to prevent cancer. Answer. What are some that just to mention, but a few? Yeah, thank you. And actually, when I look at the youth, uh, I'm actually very worried, and not just me, most of the people in the healthcare sector, mm. because uh, they, there are some of the risk factors we call modifiable risk factors. These mm. are the things like use of tobacco. If you look at uh, the consumption of tobacco nowadays, among the youth, among very the youth, it's, it's very high. And now they have moved from the usual cigarettes. Mm. Now we are doing uh, shisha, we are doing vaping, uh, <laughs> some are even now moved to chewing all those are tobaccos and and you know, it, 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 it has become a thing especially yes. on social media yes. and people see it as a trend yes yeah. and uh, from that i can tell uh, in the next 10 15 years mm. we, the country might not be able to cope with the burden of cancer from, yeah. from those are some of their lifestyles mm -hmm. number two if you look at uh, alcohol consumption which is also another risk factor which uh, is uh, modifiable mm -hmm. again the youth are consuming a lot of alcohol yeah. both the the conventional and the illicit uh, then if you look at uh, health diets the youth no longer take uh, vegetables they no longer take fruits mm -hmm. we like uh, quick simple foods Fast foods. The fast foods, and those foods have uh, has a lot of uh, fat in it and other chemicals that could also predispose one to uh, cancer. You had so, mentioned a few you, 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 earlier before when you started. You mentioned that uh, uh, nowadays the li the lifestyle has changed. Yes, yes. People are are, are people want quick things. Yes. The microwaves. Uh, yes. You know. Yes. And actually, even uh, if you look at, uh, even in terms of transport, mm. people used to walk maybe from Upper Hill to CBD. <laughs> but nowadays, if you tell the youth to do that, Uber, they, yeah, Uber <laughs> or there is a motorbike guy or uh -huh. whatever. So even in terms of physical inactivity, we are not active as we are before. Exactly. All these things now end up predisposing one to cancer. So mm -hmm. there is a lot mm -hmm. of uh, lifestyle changes that need to be addressed, mm -hmm. and especially to the youth. Mm -hmm. uh, but also the other things which the youth also need to be aware is that they uh, family genetics or things which you may not be, be able to change. Yeah. Things like if you are in your family where there is high risk of individuals having cancer, then you need to be more aware and to go for screening regularly. Because mm -hmm. then the risk of you getting the disease are slightly higher than higher. anyone else. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you look at some of these um, home uh, remedies that people uh, uh, take, they say that they're trying to prevent cancer so they would go for some concoctions. Uh, what are your thoughts in regards to that? These home remedies that people come up with yes. in the notion that I am preventing myself from getting cancer in the future. Yeah, uh, most of these concoctions are not scientifically proven. Mm. Uh, number two, they have a lot of chemicals. So once you might be thinking you are running away from cancer, mm. then you end up putting more harm into your body. For example, some people, have people taking some of these concoctions end up with kidney failure because yeah, your kidney is trying yeah. to excrete those toxins, mm -hmm. and you also end up with liver failure. So I would urge people to be very cautious as they take those uh, concussions at home because they might be more harmful uh, and very limited benefit mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, while I was going through um, some of the things that uh, pertain to cancer, I was seeing that there are different preventive measures and divided uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Maybe you can move to define to us just um, in a layman's language yes. what exactly we're talking about here. Okay. So we are looking at uh, primary prevention is where you're saying you don't have the disease and you want to remain in that state. Mm -hmm. So you, 
issues of uh, lifestyle, issues of uh, changing your lifestyle to make sure that you live a more healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. addressing the things we talked about, yeah. looking at issues of uh, early screening so that at least you don't get uh, the disease. Or oh, this and is so, so primary before yes. you get a disease? Yes. Okay. So if you move to sort of the secondary, you mm -hmm. already probably have been diagnosed with a mild uh, illness that may provoke you to get in cancer. For mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. People who have a higher risk of getting peptic ulcers or people who keep on complaining of hyperacidity, mm. they are at a higher risk of developing uh, cancers of the stomach. So if they address that early, then they reduce the risk. Sometimes oh. there are people who have a swelling and that swelling is non-cancerous. Mm. So if it's detected early and the doctor intervenes and probably removes that cancer through surgery, uh, through mm. that, that swelling through, cancer, uh, through surgery, mm. then you don't get the cancer. So that's a full sort of the secondary uh, intervention. Okay. If you move okay. to the third intervention, the individuals who already have cancer, mm. they have been cured, but they need to be followed up. Mm -hmm. Because we know because of the interventions they have received, they put them at a slightly higher risk of recurrence or getting a new type of cancer. And therefore they need to have a sort of follow-up mm -hmm. regularly by a, an oncologist who will be able to keep on uh, assessing them and, assuring, and making sure that they don't get develop the cancer. So are, are you talking about one cancer leaving or paving way for another type of cancer or one cancer uh, getting uh, you know, mild and reducing and then coming up again later on in life? Yes, there are those, so it could be two aspects. For example, you might find a lady who uh, had uh, breast cancer. Mm. Uh, it was still in early stages, mm. so it was removed and I went uh, through the whole chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, okay. Six, uh, four, five years down the line, the next breast is affected and it's purely because uh, she still retained the risk of getting the cancer. So mm -hmm. that's, that's why we say even if you are treated for cancer, you need to continue with follow-up uh -huh. because of those, uh, you still retain some risk of developing cancers in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's usually the issue the tertiary is a sort of a preventive mechanism. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Now, uh, what would be your, your advice to the Kenyan youth today when it comes to preventing cancers? Because people have these myths and misconceptions yes. uh, uh, about cancer prevention. Yes. Okay, well, that's a very good question. So, well, people, the youth need to appreciate that cancer is not uh, what people think, used to think is about witchcraft or is because of uh, traditional curses and such things. Mm -hmm. It's mostly something to do with either the environment you are in mm -hmm. uh, and as, like the lifestyle or it's because of the genetics. You can't run away from your genetics. If they, like the blacks have a higher risk of developing some sites of cancers than the, mm -hmm. than the whites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, women have higher risk of developing some cancers than, than men. Mm -hmm. So those are things you might not be able to change from your environment. But the youth, what they need to really focus on is things they are able to control the mm -hmm. lifestyle. And uh, I keep on ins insisting they need to really to look at their lifestyle and change their lifestyle because that's where we'll be able to win this battle against cancer. And you know, the, it's, it's interesting because if you look at the uh, rates of uh, uh, stress among the youth, it has increased so much. Yes. And uh, one common thing that I always hear, I, ev everywhere I go, uh, peptic ulcers, peptic ulcers. Yet, if we do not deal with it at the primary stage, yes. it can actually become stomach ulcers. Yes. Um, I want to, uh, to uh, briefly touch on some of these uh, methodologies of uh, uh, cancer screening uh, because that is now where we get into uh, the cure. Yes. And or, 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 or treatment. Mm. Um, how is it that you transition now uh, from screening into treatment what is the procedure? How should uh, that Kenyan youth understand these modalities that pertain to uh, all the steps that okay. are, there, uh, are within? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. For example, if you look at uh, a disease like uh, breast cancer, mm. so it, individuals who we encourage for women who are probably about 30, they mm -hmm. need to go to a hospital and uh, get a healthcare provider mm -hmm. examine their breast. Mm -hmm. When they get to the age of 40, then they, get, they, they apart from the healthcare provider examining their breast, they need to go through mammography. So mammography is a what sort is of sort of, sort of as an X-ray, mm -hmm. which now looks at the inner part of the breast to see whether there are any changes. Okay. If through, through that process, then the the doctor picks that there, there are some changes within the breast. Mm. Then the, what will happen is that they now go to a process of a biopsy. So all, all, all this time, does this happen once or is it a series of uh, uh, you know, 
treatment? It's, it's a series of uh, process. It's, it's a I, process. Yes, it's okay. actually a process. Uh -huh. Because once now the biopsy is removed and the, 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 doc, the doctor is able to confirm the patient has cancer, uh -huh. then now the treatment starts. Uh -huh. So, so are there the same case even for something common, which is the, like the cervical cancer? It's co caused by, a, uh, mostly associated with a virus called human papilloma virus. Mm -hmm. So what we encourage in the ladies who are 25 years and above is that mm -hmm. they need to go for screening to identify whether they have that infection or the human papilloma virus infection. Mm -hmm. Once they hit the age of 30, uh, we, apart from screening, we need also to follow up. If your screening is stands positive, then we have to make sure that we follow up very closely mm -hmm. to ensure that you don't get developed into the, getting the cancer. Mm -hmm. If you get the cancer, then now we start you on treatment. Um, you, you've talked about the cervical cancer. Yes. I want to bring it yet an, a, another type of cancer, especially during these times of COVID, yes. the lung cancer. Yes. Um, you know, how does it uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, get handled in this particular scenario of uh, okay. the, the screening and the treatment. Okay. Lung cancer is quite uh, challenging to in terms of screening, unlike uh, the common cancers. Mm. Uh, one is because uh, it's a very hidden organ, mm. but what uh, current people are doing is that uh, for individuals who are at risk, Mm. And they have to be assessed uh, because they have maybe they are smokers or they have a high family uh, incidence of uh, lung cancer. So what happens is that uh, and, uh, a, a sort of uh, investigation first they might do a, an X-ray just to check whether the lungs are okay. Yeah. If if there is something suspicious, then probably they might do more investigative mm. or in intensive investigations, and uh, that investigations might involve even taking a, a sample of areas affected mm. just to be sure whether is a uh, lung cancer or something else. Remember in our region, uh, lung cancer is not the commonest, yeah. but, it's, but it's, we are starting to see patients uh, having this. And one of the challenges that uh, in our area is also we have a lot of TB, mm -hmm. which sometimes can be mistaken for lung cancer. So again, for patients who have been diagnosed with TB, I always advise them that they need to be very cautious. If they are not getting well with TB treatment, they mm -hmm. need to seek a second opinion. Because I've seen instances patients who have uh, been receiving TB treatment mm -hmm. only to be really discovered later they have on lung, the, cancer. lung cancer. And most of the time, by the time now that discovery is being made, mm -hmm. they're already in advanced stages. And and you've taken so you've gone you've, you've taken so many pills and drugs yes, and yes. just so too much so much in your body that your body can't take it. Very well. Um, wh when it comes to uh, the COVID uh, nineteen virus, um, is there a connection between this COVID virus and uh, the lung cancer? And can one affect the other? Considering that we are trying to advocate for people to get uh, vaccinated. Yes, very good question. If you look at uh, the impact of COVID uh, virus on the lungs, it has a lot of uh, it causes a lot of damages. Mm -hmm. So if one has any other underlying lung disease. Mm -hmm. then your you uh, chances of you getting severe form of COVID are high. And also mm -hmm. getting recovery and treatment mm -hmm. will also be very challenging. Mm -hmm. So I've seen uh, instances where some individuals had probably TB before, and then they get uh, COVID. Those people, they try to get the severe form of COVID. And, mm -hmm. and most of the instances even have, uh, we end up losing some of those patients. Wow, wow, in, it's the wow. same case even with the uh, lung cancer. Mm -hmm. So I would advise uh, people who have had histories of illnesses on the, with their lungs, they need to be very cautious. They need to make sure they are vaccinated mm -hmm. and they need to adhere with all the COVID related protocols to ensure that they don't get the COVID disease. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. And uh, it, it, it's interesting because we, we live at a time where people allow, uh, some are so fearful. Um, if someone coughs, Next yes. to you, yes, <laughs> you, you run, you run. <laughs> <laughs> very true. It is a normal cough, yes. uh, maybe it's, that, there is just something in the air or some or, mm. or some allergic yes. reaction. Then yes. you, oh, you cough, uh, people are, are fearful. Um, I want us to touch on the perspectives in, uh, of finance, and uh, this is a very heavy one because many are complaining that it is expensive. Uh, cancer treatment is expensive, uh, going for chemotherapy, very expensive, and it takes a toll on somebody. You know, uh, what are your thoughts in regards to this? Is there um, light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to this financial baggage that people are going through? Uh, if, if I reflect back uh, probably six, seven years ago, yeah. uh, and 
it's, it's a, I think the situation is getting better. Before mm. the NHIF, like the National Hospital Insurance Fund, uh, used to cater very little for cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. But with the continuous advocacy from different stakeholders uh, and also the input from the government, the NHIF is coming up again in terms of supporting cancer patients. But it's not to the required extent. Mm. For example, there are some patients who have uh, an IPIC1 disease like uh, prostate cancer, and you find they have been put on some medication and you find one dose for a month, mm. probably they need to, to spend about 130,000. Yeah. That's not affordable to most of the common families in Kenya. Mm. So we, we are still pushing the government to make sure that uh, as they implement the universal health coverage, that they also factor in the cancer treatment uh, and also palliative care so that these patients can be able to get the required support without mm -hmm. uh, experiencing the hard economic uh, challenges mm -hmm. uh, associated with treatment. Because as you said, cancer treatment is quite expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm looking at uh, the, there is a bill in parliament that, that, that is going to be discussed today. Yes. Um, that is going to touch on NHIF. Mm. That will require all others to, you know, pay for yes. it. Yes. But uh, I'm looking at the effects, especially for uh, those with chronic diseases, including cancer. Um, is it going to have an effect on uh, cancer patients, especially when it comes to their money? And uh, how deep can that, does this actually go, especially considering that we have uh, Kenyans who are mostly middle class and lower class? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, it's a good concern to most of the healthcare providers. Mm. One is we are happy that if we are able to bring more people on board, yeah. then we have more resources towards the... Uh, to, to, that can be able to cover for patients who need support from yeah. NHIF. The biggest uh, challenge I foresee is that uh, they also want to put some sort of a, uh, capping in terms of what would be the benefits to some of these patients. Yes, yes. And that might also be able to affect families uh -huh. significantly. Because I've seen they want to reduce, like the, for the patients who are undergoing dialysis, I think they uh -huh. want to reduce from 9,000 to 6,000. 6, yes. yes, so you start wondering then who covers the difference. Because the uh -huh. hospitals will still continue charging the same amount unless the government then intervenes and uh, reduces the figures. Uh -huh. So they need to approach it with a very, uh, with caution and also having in mind the people with the chronic illnesses. And my urge is to the government, I wish they could also pump in more resources mm. so that at least even as we recruit more people on board to NHIF, then you also have funding from the government to cater for, mm -hmm. for the patients with chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, you know, w w what would be your, your, uh, your voice to that Kenyan who is concerned about this bill that is going to be discussed in the parliament? The voting is going to be today. Yes. Um, I don't know if it's at, no, it hasn't started yet yes. um uh, what would be your, your 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 voice to that kenyan what would you tell that kenyan who is concerned that uh, it could affect them negatively if it is passed uh i think we stand to lose to to gain more if mm -hmm. we have more people joining the scheme yeah uh we we, we start to and, and i think uh, most of us by now we we, we are in 10 or 15 WhatsApp groups for people fundraising for medical treatment. If all these individuals had in HIF, most mm. likely will not uh, be spending all this money exactly, supporting. Exactly, yeah. So I would be urge actually most of the people to actually agree and support the move. Let mm. everyone have an HIF coverage. And then once we have more resources, then we can push for better packages mm -hmm. for people, and especially for chronic illnesses, so that yeah, at least yeah. we have people uh, being almost catered fully mm -hmm. for during the course of their treatment. It, it, it means that things that we need to do to cushion ourselves during times like this. Um, how, how, how best can we be able to minimize these risks uh, that uh, are there on the ground? Is there a way that that kind of youth watching today can be able to uh, set himself up or herself up in order to cushion themselves um, from these uh, effects of cancer. Yeah, so one, uh, you have, one has to set individual goals and mm. has to also to have a sort of individual responsibilities. Yeah. I know the youth have a lot of uh, pressure. Mm. I see nowadays they say there is bogey, there is Gwenje, <laughs> there is all these <laughs> things are happening. Exactly. And yeah. they have to be sort of aligned with that sort of movement. Mm, mm, but mm. Uh, remember what I have seen is that uh, once you are hit by the disease, yeah. it affects you as an individual and not you as a bogey. 
So, so one, one another reason why people have to make individual decisions and mm. follow them. So, and have their own personal principles. So that if your <laughs> bogey decides uh. they want to go and smoke, you know the impact of smoking on yeah. your health, and you're yeah. able to say, no, I'm not going to join that group. Mm -hmm. I better be looked like uh, I'm not blaming with them but for the sake of your health. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, one of the other challenges I've seen with the youth is also that there is a lot of uh, risky sexual activities, mm. which also predispose these youth to a lot of uh, um, a lot of cancers, mm. and not just cancers associated with the sexual organs, mm. but now also we are starting to see an increase in sex, uh, cancers of the throat, uh, cancer of the in the mouth, and even anal cancers. And if you look. I critically you realize and also has some elements in, in terms of the sexual practices. Yeah, so even yeah, the youth yeah. also need to be aware that some of these things which end up looking like very fun and entertaining could have very uh, catastrophic health effects. Exactly. On them. exactly. They need to take individual responsibility. Uh, we, we need to take care of ourselves. Eh? Yes. And we, we shouldn't take life for granted. Very some nice. say we, you only live once. There was a time I challenged that notion and I said, yes, but you also die once. Very true. Very true. Um, I, I want you to tell us, because you, you are a palliative care provider, um, how do you do this as you handle cancer patients, just in a nutshell? So cancer patients have multiple challenges. Yeah. So they have physical uh, issues like pain. Uh, they have, uh, most of them, if they are receiving chemotherapy or other interventions, they will come with weaknesses, they will come with uh, nausea, vomiting. Mm. So as a palliative care provider, what we do is look at their physical symptoms and yeah. especially issues like pain and manage it. Mm -hmm. We also look at these patients from the social perspective, their settings, and especially patients coming from the informal settlement. How do we bring in the community to support them so that they can be able to work with this journey? Remember, most of the, these patients, when they get the disease, family members, friends, all of them they leave these patients. So this patient mm -hmm. works the journey alone. So we bring mm -hmm. the communities and friends together mm -hmm. so that they can be able to support these patients and the family. Yeah. We also do so, so what we call psychosocial support to help the patient cope mm -hmm. with the disease and the family uh, in terms of counseling. We also help uh, in terms of spiritual support because we are a very spiritual society. Mm -hmm. So patients start asking, what have I done to my maker to deserve this illness? And bringing on board the spiritual leaders who will be able to guide them helps mm -hmm. a lot. Because they a lot of stigma yes. that is attached to cancer. Yes. And finally, we also work closely with the legal practitioners mm -hmm. because uh, patients also need to make uh, legal decisions regarding one, their health, mm -hmm. and if the disease is also in advanced stages, they also need to make decisions regarding their, their inheritance, their properties, their children, and that's for a, health, a, practi a practitioner in the palliative care field mm -hmm. has to look out for this patient from a holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So you address all these issues to ensure that the patient is well supported and also the family members. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, what what you do it, <laughs> I it should not be taken for granted. Actually, it 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 it, it needs heart, it needs patience, and it it needs understanding. What are some of these um, the experiences you've had as you handle cancer patients that you know took you by storm? You know there there are those instances instances where you you you, you meet somebody and uh, you interact with them and then they they tell you things or they go through some, something that makes you you know uh, go back and learn to appreciate what you have because at the end of the day it's also a learning process yeah. even for for a palliative mm. care provider it is probably i would maybe summarize it by giving a case example yeah uh we recently received a call from a community health volunteer to go and see a patient in uh, one of the slums mm. uh so we met this lady who is about uh, in her late 30s i think she must be around 38. Mm. she's a single mother of three oh. she has uh, the last one is four years um, then uh, she has advanced breast cancer Mm. When uh, she went, uh, underwent mastectomy, mastectomy is removal of the breast. Mm. The husband said, I married a lady with two breasts. Now you have one. Uh -huh. uh, I don't see us now continuing with this sort of relationship and family. And the husband walked away. So they got this, a divorce. They separated. Wow. So you, you find this lady who now depends on well wishers and the neighbors mm -hmm. to feed her family. You find uh, the firstborn who is in uh, form one mm -hmm. is a primary caregiver. So she has to come from school, prepare the meals for the family, yeah. uh, and also dress the mother because the mother is bedridden. Mm -hmm. So you sit back and you, you start wondering uh, what, what would be the life of this 
children because for sure the mother is having an advanced disease and is going to die. Mm -hmm. What will happen to the, these children in terms of their school, in terms of their welfare? And also you start also wondering what is going through the mind of this mother, mm -hmm. seeing that she's helpless and she's receiving support from the kids wow. and well-wishers. Wow. Those things are the things you start appreciating when you wake up in the morning and you have a cup of tea in your house and somebody else is screaming in pain because of the disease mm -hmm. and then they don't have anyone else to support them. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. which, which one day, uh, at another time, we should have a conversation on palliative care providers. Because you, you, in as much as you're giving care to someone, you also need someone to care for you. Very true. Am I right? Very true. Very true. Huh. There are instances when my team uh, visits a patient, they come back probably at around uh, one or two, uh -huh. and looking at their faces, I just tell them, take a break. <laughs> because the, the trauma, they the have emotions... They had a long day. Yes, had a long day in the office. Wow. <laughs> yes. Ah. It's, it, it, it's good, and, and that's why we need, you know, we need to, to really emphasize on this. Cancer screening and prevention is very, very important. It's very. What is Nairobi Hospice all about, just in brief? So we are a charity organization that was established about 30 years ago mm -hmm. to support patients and families who are diagnosed with hard to cure illnesses. Mm -hmm. we, we ask, we don't only focus on cancer, but we also focus with patients with HIV, organ failure, mm -hmm. any illness that we know is going to have a significant impact on patients' life and the family. Mm -hmm. So we look at the patients from a holistic perspective. Yeah. We do home visits for patients who are very ill, so we visit them at home. And for the patients who are stable enough, they are able to come to our facility. Mm -hmm. We also organize uh, a daycare on Thursdays, so where patients come in and exchange ideas, encourage each other, mm -hmm. and sometimes we also invite professionals to come and give them uh, professional advice. Mm -hmm. So we are able to support most of the patients and uh, as an institution, about almost 80% of the patients are not able even to pay for our services. So we rely on well-wishers to be able to raise funds to continue supporting these patients. Oh, oh. Yeah. And, 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 and you're doing a fantastic job so far. Thank you very um, much. I, I, I want us to wrap this conversation, just to bring it to a close. In a nutshell, our take-home for the day when it comes to cancer screening and prevention. I want you to speak to that Kenyan youth who is watching you uh, out there. What will be your final word? Uh, my final word is that uh, you have to take individual responsibility about your health. It's no longer about a group or a movement, but it's about you uh, taking responsibility, addressing the issues we have mentioned about uh, risk factors, and ensuring that you go for regular screening, and mm -hmm. you also support individuals and families that are affected with this disease. Oh. Dr. Kinyanjui, thank you for coming. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I appreciate it so much. Really appreciate um, it. You're doing a good job. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, he, that is Dr. Kinyanjui, the pa palliative care provider, also the CEO of uh, Nairobi Hospice. Uh, check them out. Reach, how can people reach out to you, by the way? Yeah, so we, especially for the youth, we are yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. So if they search Nairobi Hospice, they'll be able to get us. We, we also have an office in Upper Hill, just mm. next to... Kenyatta National Hospital and before 40s. Mm -hmm. So we are, they can also pop in. And also we have a website. They'll be able to get more details about our institution. Mm -hmm. yeah, Nairobi Hospice. Check them out. Remember, go for cancer screening. Very well. Prevent yourself from getting cancer. And this conversation uh, uh, that we are having today doesn't stop here. We still have much that we have not covered, but I want to, to, to thank Nairobi Hospice and Dr. Kinyanjui for finding time to join me this morning. Keep the conversation going on our social media handles. The hashtag is Y in the morning, Y254 channel on Twitter at Y254 channel, Facebook at Ram Aguko. The hashtag, as always, is Y in the morning. We are taking a short break, but after this, we'll be back with much more. Keep it Y in the morning.